So Albert, thank you so much for being with us um, here at Kingston Reads, and thank you for making this time. So the first question I wanted to ask you, I was really fascinated by um, something you had said to me, which was um, you grew up in Highland, which is a predominantly white community. Um, and I wanted to know how you became inspired to become a teacher? What influences were most important to you growing up in terms of this career choice? Well, yes, thank you for having me. It's my pleasure to be here with you, Charlotte, and the rest of you who are joining us via virtual network, uh, Zoom. Um, you know, at first I, I didn't know that I was gonna be a teacher. I had two other aspirations. Um, of going to law school, which sometimes I still feel the itch to do, and also being a pastor, which I certainly uh, um, kind of scratch that itch sometimes as well. But um, I knew I had to be a teacher the first time I did my practice teaching um, in Massachusetts, where I was going to undergrad. And the spark of um, that feeling of having students come alive to a good question and the classroom buzzing with discussion that really you know it really hooked me and uh i i got a job early I actually worked a year at um highland high school before at new paltz and i remember very well um growing up in highland being one of the only black kids in the school um and how significant it was at times to feel the pressure of no one really understanding what I thought about, you know, a discussion on slavery in a classroom full of white people, or you know, what I thought when people talked about crime and drug dealing and and allusions to black imagery, um, you know, feeling the pressure of that and not really being able to rely on any adults, let alone some other peers, you know, I did have some peers, but not always in my classroom, mm -hmm. um, to, to, to talk in a way that would facilitate and, an, you know, progress through difficult conversations and kind of carrying the weight of that around as a young person. Um, I, I thought of those experiences um, when I chose to uh, teach at a predominantly white school, because I was thinking about, you know, being in that classroom and, and also now being the teacher that I could, I could completely relieve a student if they wanted to not even be, feel as if they had to be present. You know what I mean? That the pressure, the pressure that often kids feel is to answer every question as a representation of your entire race when you're in there trying to get an education, you know, and often the education that you need is not even available or accessible for you. And it's very, in, on multiple layers, it's paralyzing, it can be uh, frustrating. And the hardest, the hardest thing for a student um, is to know what is bothering them in those moments. They can't always, you can't always articulate it. So having a teacher there that can, I think it does a lot for students, especially when they're a micro minority, if you will, or a micro uh, uh, um, representative of their race in, in a, a largely white school. Right. So rather than right. So so kind of looking at it as almost like a desert situation. And then you're going in there like because there's nobody else. So that was that was clearly important to you because um, it would have been very different. For example, had you gone into this, you know, into New York City, into a city school, very different experience, certainly an option. And mm -hmm. maybe would it have been a more comfortable option? I mean, there there are challenges to being one of the only teachers of color, one of the only people of color in a community. Sure. Yeah, and um, you know, there, the, the wonderful thing about going to the school where maybe there's a lot more staff of color and there are a lot more students of color is that um, myself as a teacher, I don't, you don't feel the desire or the burden to carry the weight of representing, you know, your, your people and your culture to the school, the professional staff there, to the administration, to the parents in the community and to the white students or even to all the students, you know, you don't feel you, uh, it would be in a lot of ways, very relieving for me to do, to do that. Um, and, you know, I, I don't, I don't look at myself, you know, um, in any kind of 
um, heroic frame when I'm there for those kids of color in, mm -hmm. in these schools. I'm really just, you know, doing what I think I wanted Mm -hmm. as a as a young person and it's not just for the for the black and brown children you know white kids don't often see professional people of color in in the schools yeah. and it's important to to um break through some of the caricatures that are created around us for for white people because i think to be honest a lot of what needs to be undone about racism needs to be undone by white people. And when white people, you know, live in um, environments where they're not challenged, and, and I, don't, I don't mean challenged as in being always confrontational, sometimes you need to be confrontational, but your presence, my presence in spaces is, is by itself sometimes a challenge to the caricatures and stereotypes that exist around black men and around black people. And um, being in those spaces is a, a first level of disturbance, if you will. And then of course the conversations that can come afterwards. Certainly, certainly. And, and so it, it seems to me in a way, and I know you say it's not heroic, but, I, and I know I, I hear that you're feeding who you were as a child and what you would have wanted, but also you're choosing to be in a less comfortable environment to bring kind of a greater awareness. and. And so that maybe it's a little less comfortable for you as an, as an adult in this world, and yet knowing what you're able to bring to this community, both for, for um, black and brown students and for white students and for faculty, that your presence is, is a piece of the growth that I think we need to have happen in, in our schools, for sure. Yeah, I do. I do see it that way, you know, and you know, it's also interesting about something you just mentioned about my comfort level. When I went, you know, I went through high, Highland High School being, being, I used to call myself the period on the page, you know, me, me and a few other of my, my classmates, and then, uh, you know, elementary school, middle school and high school, and then I went away to, to college, and I went to an international school that had 44% people of color, which was a, an extraordinary shift for me. Mm -hmm. um, um, and, you know, that was wonderful, um, but I always felt compelled, you know, to, to come back to, to my community and to be in, in a school like the school that I had left. And um, I have definitely developed a comfort with the discomfort of that. And, and I don't know, you know, there's, a, there's, a, there is, there's, of course, language, culture, norms, all these different things that in white spaces you pay attention to that I've gotten to the point where I don't even all the time pay attention to them. I'm just operating in this space, you know? And, but, um, you know, I, I, do, I do think about what it would have been like to, to, teach, to teach. I mean, I applied at Poughkeepsie. They didn't get back to me uh, quickly at the time. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, yeah, I, I do sometimes think about what it would have been like to teach at a school that was more populated with people of color. Yeah, and I mean, it sounds like, you know, you've developed a, a, a sort of, well, the double consciousness to the point of being bilingual, right? So mm -hmm. you're bilingual and you've created, and there's value in that. Sure. Um, it, it, which, which brings me to the question of, we, we, you know, tonight we're talking about the need to hire more black and brown educators in Kingston. Um, the ratio is 45.5% children of color to 4.5% faculty, mm -hmm. teaching staff of color. And um, what, um, it's not just about the people we hire, but the messages we bring, right? And, and right. Dr. Um, Bettina Love speaks about um, hiring um, educators of color who are engaged in an active anti-racist orientation, right? So it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it goes deeper than that. And I know that you've been able to bring that work to your school. Can you talk a little bit about the work? So it's not just that you are present as a black man in a predominantly white space. It is what you bring with sure. you. Yeah, that, you know, that's important to have an actively anti-racist um, um, disposition and to work uh, along those lines, not just to be present as a person of color. Um, um, 
for a, for a lot of reasons that's important, but um, some of the things that we've been able to do, I, I co-advise with um, a few of my colleagues, a club called the um, uh, Youth for Unity Club. And the Youth for Unity Club works to put together programs that are educational for the whole school around issues of race, around issues of uh, gender, around issues of class, around issues of language and ethnicity. And for, for example, one of the things I'm most proud of was we established um, a norm in the school and on Black History Month, even though this year we didn't do it because of, of, of the COVID restrictions, where the, the whole school day is, is canceled essentially. Well, yeah. and we um, like create that. three different stations in the school, one in the auditorium, one in the cafeteria and one in the gymnasium. And the uh, auditorium is a more academic historical uh, lecture Sometimes you know the 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 officers get us to make it more uh, fun and game oriented, but the advisors are always trying to get some serious serious yeah. lecture in on on whatever our theme is. Like, and then the uh, the cafeteria we have food that matches the theme from the African diaspora that we've uh, selected. And then in the in the gym, mm -hmm. we have um, a cultural arts celebration where it's participatory participatory for the students to enjoy. So we've, we've done uh, the Caribbean and African, the African diaspora. Mm -hmm. We've done the Harlem Renaissance as a theme and mm -hmm. we've done uh, civil rights struggle movements as a theme. And so, yeah. so the, uh, we get uh, Caribbean food in the cafeteria and then uh, dancing and music lessons in the gym yeah. and then lecturing yeah. on the various islands in the, in, in the African diaspora and the Caribbean um, in the auditorium. And um, what we found is that not only do a lot of kids, you know, there are kids that will be like, oh, we're, we're doing this and I'm not coming to school today. You know, there are kids that will do that. Yeah. But uh, a lot of the kids tell me that this is the best, you know, it's the best day of the year for them because they have this, you know, they got 30 minutes in the place and then they switch and they move around and a couple hundred kids move into the various places. And the club is about 30 kids and they cook all the food or they, we bring in, we bring in local, um, restaurant owners or family members to teach them how to cook. So the kids are learning. And um, we really try to take an, uh, um, a, not an aggressive stance in the teaching part, but a, not simply talk about factual relaying information, mm -hmm. but advocating for an attitude of trying to tear down um, um, systemic problems as it pertains to the people that are being affected by it because you know you're talking about the cultural celebration, but you can't um, take that out of the context of uh, race and racism. Right. So you know, um, you know, we also did a similar assembly where we had a panel discussion after the whole school viewed Thirteenth, the documentary. Yeah, and we had a, a panel discussion um, with local police, the state police, the uh, town police. Um, community uh, members and parents, students and uh, history teachers. Mm -hmm. And all of us, it was about nine of us on, a, on the stage while the students listened, all of us discussed our reactions and our thoughts about 13th. And then we had the, we had kids come up with pre-written pre questions that they could uh, read off of a card into the mic where the panel listened and answered. And that was also a really powerful experience where we had the whole school. And if you can have a, a, a cooperating principle, um, which we did, we did have um, at the time, you really can have some a powerful, powerful impact on, on, on your school body. Yeah, I mean, that's what I was going to ask you that the support that you've gotten, um, again, from who, who, who has been supportive of you? And has there been any pushback um, for for the work that you're doing and for the person who, who you are? Well, um, I was hired in 97. Mm -hmm. And when I got hired in 1997, New Paltz, um, the, the principal there, Barbara Clinton, um, you know, she she did, she was, I, I she was, I wouldn't say she was pushed to hire me, but there was a there was a community activist group called Concerned Parents that was on the, you know, on the time of the board and on the time of the principal about the fact that they were not teachers of color being being hired in this school or uh, and retained and um concerned parents um mentioned my name to her and she called me in the summertime and, at my house really i got the interview and then i got the job 
And so she had, uh, you know, an interest in nurturing, of course, my professional development. And she really gave me um, opportunities to develop in the school to the point in which when she did ask me if I wanted to teach a Black history course, I created it. I created the curriculum, the pacing, everything. I was I, no interference with whatever I did. And I, and I carried, you know, I carried out, you know, and I still do carry out a Black History One and Black History Two curriculum at the school. Um, so she was very supportive and she made space for me to, to be authentically myself as a teacher and a, also a Black teacher and um, teaching, teaching issues of race and racism integrated into the Black History curriculum. So, um, you know, there, there's, there's always pushback, but um, at New Paltz, I, I think that the pushback would be much greater if there are more black folks in New Paltz. You know, the, the number is so small. There are 5% uh, African-American uh, kids and about 6% Latino mm -hmm. um, and smaller percentages of South Asian and East Asian kids at the school. Yeah. So Very it doesn't put pressure yeah, very it doesn't put pressure. Art. Yeah, right. Yeah, it doesn't put pressure on the demographics and people, people behave differently under the idea that there's some sort of cultural threat of, uh, with a pre the presence of people who are different than them. And uh, they perceive that idea through numbers. And so at New Paltz, you know, um, the, the only kind of pushback that I've, I've gotten about my, around my course are you know statements perhaps arguing with something that maybe a kid comes home and talks to their family about right. and what I and I love that because yeah. when the kids are going home talking to their families about things that we're discussing in class and the parent calls me uh, then I get another class so I don't mind that at all yeah you know, that's great I don't, right? I don't mind that at all but yeah. you know in the larger infrastructural um, context you know there's been challenges um, I was on a committee that was being designed to um, create a K through 12 uh, anti-racism curriculum for the whole school. And, you know, uh, needless to say, that was very, very challenging. And we haven't, we haven't been successful in getting it done. Um, there's a, a workshop, an amazing workshop by the People's Institute called the Undoing Racism Workshop mm -hmm. that um, uh, I recommended along with others for uh, the team that was doing this curriculum to start to start with as a foundational basis for understanding systemic racism in America. And that, that, that workshop set off the beginning of the end for the whole process. Oh, it was no. It oh. was so challenging for so yeah. many white folks to really uh, deal with the naked truth about how systemic racism was created and how it supports and protects white interests and exploits black bodies and, 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 and experiences. And so there, no, there are, yeah, I was gonna say, so it's like, okay, if you teach it, but we right. don't want to, right? <laughs> right? So we'll let Albert do it, but like, we're not going to change what we're doing. How nice that Albert's over there teaching what he's teaching. Yeah, and yeah. I have, I have, yeah, it's like that. And I have um, a great department, you know, I have about one, two, three, four, four or five um, colleagues within the department that really are, despite the fact that we haven't gotten a K-12 curriculum, integrating anti-racism, uh, new examination of co colonialism, teaching non-Eurocentric content. Um, you know, so several of my colleagues have really, you know, aggressively tried to, to do what we should be doing around these issues anyway. Yeah. But, Good. you know, it's, um, it's not absent of its problems, but I'm sure that if we had a, a different demographic, it would be much more challenging to 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 work in the arena that we're we're working in now. Well, and that's what we're right. So that's going to be our next our next three guests will be talking specifically about this district. And it was so helpful, Albert, to hear about your 24 years of well, 25, right, with Highland. Um, mm -hmm experience in this region and what you've been able to accomplish. And um, even though our community is different, there will be certain um, certain takeaways from your story that I hope people will hear tonight and, and be able to consider 
um, in terms of the need th that, that that is undeniable, that there is an incredible need to hire educators of color and to retain educators of color yes. for the benefit of all of our students and all of our faculty. I mean, yes. So, yeah, I agree with you. I agree with you. I think that, that I, I hope that the need is obvious to many. And um, if not, you know, advocates like yourself and, and others and myself, we have to keep speaking because the children, a lot of these children only get one chance through, you know, we're, we are here, we're here and we, we've made a career out of it. And, and we kind of have a different perspective, but these kids have one chance through and you, you know, so many uh, folks are, are their, their, their lights are snuffed out by the experience while we argue about whether or not, you know, uh, it matters if they have uh, people that look like them yeah. helping them along the way. You know? Absolutely, absolutely. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. And we look forward to continuing to speak with you. My pleasure.